Hello, my name is Dwayne Moore, and this is my film pre presentation on Metropolis, which came out in uh, 1927. And right here, I have the poster for the movie, um, and I think it's a very iconic poster. It's very recognizable. So, what is Metropolis exactly about? Uh, it is about a ut utopian society with two extreme classes. Yeah, the people that live above, they're uh, in the upper city. I don't think there was any particular name for them. And then there's people that work below in the worker city. Um, that's actually, I think, what they're called in the movie. There's also a religious type element in this film to where Maria, she is a teacher in the worker city, um, talks about a mediator that will come to save them, which is Freder, and he is the son of uh, Joe Freder, who runs the upper city. So there's that kind of like religious dynamic, you know, like the savior of sorts um, that's going to come and save the people of the worker city. It was released in March 13, 1927 in the U.S. At that time, it was already cut down to about an, an hour and 45 minutes. Um, there was a two and a half hour cut of the movie that disappeared for a very long time. And it was actually found a few years ago in Argentina. And what they did is they took footage from that film and spliced it with the newer ones. The footage that they found is older or it's like not well preserved. Uh, the cut of the movie that I saw was the two and a half hour one. And you can definitely tell which one is the um, found footage. And that is the one that I would recommend for people to see. That way you can... Uh, see the whole thing in its entirety the way it's meant to be seen So what are the some of the semantics in the film? Well, I think Tech tech is a big one there. Um, it's crazy to think that this movie came out almost 100 years ago and It was relevant then and it's maybe much more relevant now what this movie does show is that uh, technology is already a part of our lives um, for the upper class and the people or the people in the upper city they may be using technology for for luxury purposes and living the good life eating good food even though that's not shown but it is kind of implied and for the people at the bottom um, they keep the upper city running uh, they're they're pulling on big levers uh, spinning big gears Although it doesn't go into detail, it's clear that it's backbreaking work for, for those people that live in the worker city. I would also say that the people above represent corporations, uh, white collar work. They don't really get their hands dirty. And um, there's not that many people up there, but whoever lives up there, uh, they're living the good life. Kind of like now, right? Like not everybody's rich. And for the people that are rich, Hey, they can uh, fly all over the world, buy whatever they want, uh, you name it, eat wherever. So what are some of the metaphors for the movie? Well, it's pretty clear that the people in the worker city, the people below, are slaves. Doesn't really show how they got there, but ultimately, um, you know, they're doing backbreaking work. And uh, the other one is Freder, the son of the guy that runs the upper city, Joe Freder. He is like the messiah for the working class people, kind of like a Jesus Christ type character where uh, they put faith in him to save the people of the worker city so they're not working so hard. And ultimately in the movie, he does do that. The allegory that I see is uh, capitalism. The people in the upper city work really hard. Uh, well, white collar hard work to get to where they are. And, um, you know, in a way they're kind of taking uh, control or advantage over the people at the work city, at the worker city. No different than what we see uh, as American consumers, you know. I think we all know that Nike shoes don't cost $250 to make, you know. Uh, it's way less than that. And for the ideologies, I think the people up top want to keep things unequal. They want to keep their lives going. They don't want to 
lose their lifestyle and the people at the bottom want equality that they maybe not necessarily want to be rich and live the good life, but they definitely don't want to be doing that backbreaking work anymore. So I thought this was an interesting one, um, the representations of males, of, of the gender. Uh, the males represent power, heart, and work. So the people up top, uh, they're mainly, they, they really didn't show any females, but they represent the power, right? Uh, they, they run things, um, what they say goes. Um, Fredder, the son of uh, Joe Frederson, the one that ends up, saving the pe the people in the worker city uh he represents heart because he at in the beginning of the movie he ends up going down there finding out about these people didn't know who they were but he Im immediately um empathized with them and even actually started you know turning some gears and stuff for a guy that uh i guess his shift was changing and once he saw them he wanted to help them out um and he didn't even know that they existed. And of course, uh, work. Uh, everyone in the worker city, uh, with exception of Maria, but she, not clear how she got there, uh, are all men. And they're doing backbreaking work to keep uh, the upper city running. For the female representation, it's, it's a lot easier in this movie because there is only one character and it's Maria. There are two versions of Maria. There's a human one and a robot one. The human one, she represents hope. Uh, she's a teacher in the worker city and she's always giving out good positive messages while the robot Maria represents sex and seduction. And there's actually even a very hypnotizing scene where she, the robot Maria is dancing around and seducing a uh, room full of men uh, up in the upper city. For the representation of sexuality, I will um, focus on both Marias for this slide. So the human Maria, she has a subdued type of sexuality, like a girl next door, somebody you want to know, uh, very, shown to be very caring and giving, dresses very conservatively. Um, she seems to have no interest in men, just... Uh, kind of in a way just wants to give people hope about the future uh, because she does live down there in a worker city. So for the robot Maria, she's far more sexual than the uh, human one shown to uh, wear less clothing, especially in one scene where she does the seduction dance. And I mean, thinking something about 100 years ago, this must have really... Uh, upset a lot of people I'm, uh, you know I'm just assuming because it is quite a bit of skin um, and her goal is to seduce and wield power over men which she does and in that case she's the exact opposite of the human Maria uh, the ideology of the sexuality I see here is basically for men to control uh, women um, the human Maria she was teaching what she wanted to teach. There was nobody over her, but she was gaining a lot of uh, following in the worker community. Um, so the robot Maria was essentially built to destroy her. And it's kind of a proxy kind of way of destroying the human one through a robot one. But either which way, it's the men in this movie essentially want to control the female um, and get them in line with how, you know, with their vision for how the city should be run. For the representations of race in this movie, it's very simple. Metropolis is not a mixed society. Um, everyone is the same race, I'm guessing and assuming that they are of uh, Anglo-Saxon descent. Uh, the movie doesn't really deal with any issues of race. It just really deals with that very extreme class divide. For the representation of this class in this movie, it's very simple and I've uh, mentioned it in a past few slides already, but it's the upper class and the lower class. Uh, the people 
in the upper class live in upper city and the lower class lives in the worker city. But just to drive the point a little bit further, it's an extreme class divide. Uh, for the I ideology that I see, the people up top really want to keep their lives going. And I think uh, for the people below, um, I think their ideology is to keep the upper city functioning, right? Uh, as crazy as that may seem. And the reason I say that is because nobody in the worker city is coming up with a plan to overthrow the people up top. Uh, they do show Maria, the human Maria, teaching of, you know, of uh, some sort of Messiah that's going to come. But what if the Messiah didn't come? What if Freder didn't arrive? They would still be working down there, uh, possibly for, for generations on end. So um, I do realize it is a controversial view, but the movie doesn't show um, that they're, you know so unhappy that they'll revolt. It shows they're unhappy because they worked hard, but maybe internally they're smiling because they're keeping the people up top running. Um, and ultimately, the movie uh, has capitalism as its ideology. You know, that's what makes both sides of that coin work, right? The, the people up top get to be in these massive buildings because of their capitalistic values. Um, that, you know, kind of, in a way, take advantage of the people in the, in the lower city, uh, down there in the worker city. So this movie doesn't feature transhumanism, but it does feature AI, and it has a massive technology presence. I actually just realized this, but Robot Maria is an AI. Uh, she is programmed and told what to do by uh, Joe Friederson and Rot Wang, but what she does is on her own, meaning every single movement of her body and what she says to people, it's not being controlled by them. Uh, so this might actually be the very first film or media depiction of AI. Um, I would have to look into that. Uh, <clears throat> and for the worker city, there's just... just giant machines that as um, I've mentioned, you know, just big gauges and gears and levers. It doesn't go into detail about what they do, but it's not important. You get the point that they're big, they're massive, it takes a lot of work to move them, and it keeps the upper city uh, running. For Impact and Canon, it's crazy to think that this movie is nearly 100 years old was made really at the beginning of when film was being made and the special effects are just nothing short of amazing. Um, I, I mean, the sets are huge and the special effects is done so good it doesn't take you out of the movie. And you, and you know, uh, what I mean by that is you, sometimes you watch films like B-movies and the special effects are so bad, you're like, ah, that looked really bad. And then you stop to think about how bad it is and it takes you out of the story. Uh, another thing is on my second viewing of the movie, I want to say it kind of reminds me of Gotham City, and maybe that's where the inspiration for Gotham City came from. You know, Batman came out sometime in the mid '30s, and I, it's just easy to think when you look at the big, tall buildings in Metropolis and how the roads cut through them, and there's just some random plane flying by. Uh, really reminds me a lot of Gotham City. Uh, the movie can make you fear the future and give you hope at the same time. You know, this movie is both utopian and dystopian at the same time. Just kind of depends on maybe where you're born. You know, because if you're born in the upper class, hey, you're going to live the good life. And if you are born in the worker class, uh, the way this movie has it, you're just going to be working there forever and ever and uh, breaking your back for the people in the upper city, you know, um, so, yeah, so it gives you hope and it gives you, you know, makes you fear at the same time. So, um, what's interesting is the robot Maria and how she looks um, in terms of pop culture has actually been, I don't want to say parodied, but there have been uh, some outfits that have been worn by Beyonce and Lady Gaga that really look like it. 
Um, so that's, you know, the robot Maria is, is a very recognizable figure. Uh, talked to my mom the other day and I was telling her about this class and this movie and she's like, what is it? I'm like, well, let me show you, you know, the picture of the movie and I showed her the picture with Robert Maria. She's like, oh yeah, I know, I know what that is. Even though she's never seen it, just like me, I've never seen it prior to class. I knew of it. Maybe, I, you know, maybe if you don't know the name, you're going to recognize Robot, Robot Maria. Uh, and the other thing is, Rotwang is like, the template for every crazy mad scientist and you can see him in his picture here his right hand is cut which you know if you're a star wars fan uh luke famously gets his hand cut in um one of the movies and you know if you look at rot wang here he's just crazy you know he's pale skin crazy hair got you know very bad movements and it's just funny to think that like you know nearly 100 years later if you watch any new cartoon or or uh, you know TV show that features a mad scientist is still gonna still gonna look like this. So I'm assuming 100 years from now, the, the mad scientist will still look like that. So it's pretty interesting of how that, even though I've never seen the movie, seeing it now, after seeing all the stuff I've seen, I can see where a lot of stuff came from. You know, especially with uh, Rot Wang, it's it's very hilarious that he is the mad scientist that we all see nowadays and right here we have the bibliography page which means it's the end of my presentation thank you very much for listening and watching my video i really really enjoyed this class it really opened my eyes um i hope you guys have a good summer so take care and uh bye for now